Hello everyone, my name is Saud and welcome to the second episode of the Surge podcast. Today I'll be talking about, well, I'll be starting to talk about uh, blood and blood products. Um, It's sort of one of those niche areas that don't sound typically surgical and I'm probably one of the very few surgeons who's a little bit passionate about these things, as sad as that sounds. Uh, But for me, um, blood and blood products have sort of gone full circle from being something that is extremely bad to something that that, uh, the literature currently supports in many situations that we find ourselves as a traumatologist and as acute care physicians. And um, I remember seeing a lot of patients who were just flooded with crystalloid prior to coming to the emergency room and reached a level of hemodilution and coagulopathy that, that was quite profound on arrival. And I'm glad to see that that practice has, by and large, fallen out of favor in most uh, specialist trauma centers. So uh, we won't be talking about MTPs. We won't be talking about trolley, trig, or the adverse effects of blood and blood products. And um, we won't be talking about hemoglobin thresholds in detail. Um, I'd rather reserve a completely different uh, episode once uh, I have more than two followers and um, I have more to say on the subject and probably developed a better understanding of the practice. Uh, but what we will be talking about is a um, nuanced approach to um, knowing the basic facts about every blood product that we normally use regularly. And um, uh, to begin with, I mean, the way I look at blood products is you're taking whole blood and you're putting it through an industrial process to get your maximum bang for your buck. So... In my mind, most of us would use uh, packed RBCs, FFPs, and platelets for the most part with the cryo being used for our absolute disasters in which we see DIC and very rarely outside of that setting unless you work in a very medical ICU and have dedicated your life to it. So uh, f- as you can clearly see from the diagram I stole from um, the JPAC guidelines, um, your your most sort of delicate of blood products are platelets, and and I think that with time we'll find out that platelets are also um, the most hard to care for and probably the most expensive. They have to be agitated. They take a while to work. Um, they only last for five days, even when you cool them down completely, and. Even when they're there, they don't last that long, and they're not there for a very long time in your circulation, in most pathologies at least. Um, the second most fragile in my eyes is, is whole blood or, or packed RBCs. And um, those two categories tend to have a closer expiry date, and I think that that's a limitation of our technology more so than anything else. And hopefully the next time I review this, um, we'll have better insights into that. Uh, for the purpose of the talk, I won't be talking about things like a freezed or glycerol stored deep freeze packed RBCs. Um, I'll be talking about your bog standard normal uh, citrate um, preserved packed RBCs because that's what most of us use in an emergency situation. Now, um, while some of us are lucky enough to work in ivory tower institutions where we have excellent hematologists and uh, excellent technicians who understand the concept of a universal donor in every category, some of us may not. And um, this cartoon from Hema Quebec sort of summarizes it. And um, I'm pretty sure that all of you know this, but uh, O negative is your universal donor or universal uh, sort of packed RBC. Um, platelets can come from any source, but most of, for, for the most part, uh, type A platelets are, are sort of the universal donor for platelets. And for FFPs and plasma, it's AB, and most other uh, isolated uh, plasma factors, uh, it's AB, unless they're recombinant, in which case they're pretty much all compatible with everybody, for the most part. Um, Also, another important thing that I'd like to point out is time and time again, I see this, and it's particularly true for uh, residents being left on the floor at 2 a.m. They order the blood, and they can't realize why it takes four hours to get into the patient. One of the main limiting factors is the lack of IV access, and I implore you to order your IV access and ensure that it's there on your patient at the same time you're ordering the blood. I cannot say this enough times. If you're going to order blood, make sure your nurse is happy with the IV access that you've given them. 
Your nursing staff need to be comfortable giving the blood with whatever else is running on that IV line, and if not, then you need to put in a second line. If you're giving it for a massive blood transfusion, which we'll talk about at a later date, or a massive hemorrhage protocol, then my suggestion is use a MAC line, or a triple lumen cordis, uh, as, as you can see here, or an intraosseous line. And the reason why is because you want to have extra options. It's very rare that the hemorrhage defect will be abated by a single lumen large bore catheter. More often than not, these patients have concurrent injuries in other places or require other medications that you may not necessarily be comfortable giving through the same line. Most times it doesn't matter, but sometimes it does, and sometimes you have difficult staff helping you who would rather use an extra line. So be cognizant of it. And if you're really working against the tide, make sure that you're well prepared. But we'll talk about that at a later date. So to start with, I'd like to talk about packed RBCs. A fun fact, every unit of packed RBCs is about 250 to 300 cc's. And the reason for the variation is A, the amount of citrate that you need, and B, the, re the method by which it's extracted. Depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on, you may receive 350 cc's of... Uh, uh, per unit of packed RBCs or 250 cc's and either way you're getting about 200 cc's of actual packed cells with a, a hematocrit of about 0.9 and what that does whenever you give it is it raises your total hematocrit by about 3% or your hemoglobin by 1 gram per deciliter again this depends on which side of the Atlantic you're on and how you like to track blood yourself my personal preference is towards hematocrit because it gives me an idea of viscosity and I'll get to that later. And remember, the units of blood that you're giving do not stop bleeding. Surgery, embolization, or correcting coagulopathy is what stops bleeding. The units of blood that you're giving are to maintain cardiac output and try and maintain oxygenation. Another thing to remember is no, good, no blood is as good as fresh blood. Most of these packed RBCs that you're getting have blood that's shriveled down. It's very low in 2,3 DPG, and that impairs its oxygen exchange and leads to other complications as well, secondary to potassium leak, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So it's very important to know the type of blood that you're giving, the expiry date of the blood, and when it was manufactured. Oftentimes, your nursing staff will know it because they're the ones who are checking your blood for you. Sometimes your junior resident would be keen and, and would end up doing that for you as well. Make sure you understand that conceptually, especially if you're giving multiple units of blood back to back or expecting to do so. Another good tip to have here is if you know that you're giving blood for hypotension, give more than one unit. And the reason why is because um, on animal studies, such as the one that I've just quoted here uh, by uh, Martini et al., you can clearly see that even in cases where you're targeting a supernormal hematocrit, uh, in rodent models or in animal models, the cardiac output is augmented exponentially when you increase by about 6 to 8 to 10 percent, i.e. 2 to 4 units of blood. And I'll be talking about transfusion-related reactions and, and side effects of transfusions, and uh, I use the word side effects because there isn't a better word for it at the moment in my eyes, or the, the ramifications, that's a better word for it, there you go, the ramifications of blood transfusions. Um, the ramifications of getting one versus two units, as opposed to four to six units, aren't that much higher. So giving two units at a time is probably not the worst thing that you're going to do to your patient if they require it for hypotension or for um, hemorrhagic shock. Moving on, uh, the next uh, blood product I'd like to talk about is FFPs. So FFPs, in my eyes, are the reason why you stop bleeding. There are multiple indications to give them, but the main one, let's face it, is the fact that your patient's actively bleeding and is coagulopathic. Each unit varies between 200 and 250 cc's, and that's because each unit contains one UI of coagulating factors or coagulating proteins, depending on whether you were practicing uh, between 1980 and 1990 or from 1990 onwards. It also contains about 400 milligrams of fibrinogen, and that's why we don't see um, uh, fibrogen deficiencies all that often unless we've hit uh, levels of, of aggregate blood products above 10 to 15 units, at least statistically speaking in retrospective studies. The reason why I, I, I'm very, I have a very strong opinion on the fact that um, 
FFPs are the reason why patients survive is because for every 500 cc's of blood you use, you, you lose about 10% of your circulating uh, coagulating factors. So you can easily see that if you have a fractured femur, for example, where the estimated blood loss is between 1 and 3 liters, you pretty much lost about 30 to 40% of your coagulation factors, and that's why you have constant coagulopathy. And the minute you drop below 25% of normal coagulating factors, it begins to affect thromboelastography. And again, that's another topic we'll talk about in a later date. I'm very passionate about blood products. I know it's very rare for a surgeon. I mentioned it prior, but blood products save lives. Knowledge on blood products save lives. Planning for blood products save lives. It's the right thing to do. Reading up on these things is the right thing to do and probably the best thing to do if you'll be in the business of trauma. And each unit of... Uh, FFPs that's given raises your, your total coagulating factors by about 10%. And that's why I usually try and favor giving four units at a time. And we'll go through massive transfusion uh, practices a little bit later on. But uh, one of my pet peeves is when somebody says something along the lines of, why are you giving FFPs when the INR is 1.2, 1.4, or 1.5? And the INR of FFPs is actually 1.2. So the reason why I get really angry when somebody says that is, number one, the FFP that you're measuring, the INR off of, is very, very, very cold. It's about minus 20 degrees when you're measuring it, right? And it has citrate in it. So when you make that argument, what you're really arguing is when you have coagulopathic, very cold FFPs with citrate in them to prevent them from clotting and degrading outside a human being, the INR is 1.2. Number two, INR is an extremely poor, and I can't say this enough, INR is probably the worst, the worst marker for modern day resuscitation in terms of coagulopathy. INR changes happen very late. And in fact, an INR of 1.4 in trauma has been associated with negative outcomes. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit in another episode, hopefully. But I really do get annoyed by people who tell me that INR is something that they track in active resuscitation. And I get even more annoyed when somebody scoffs. It's usually a medical person or somebody with a very heavy medical background working in an ICU that's semi-elective or elective. And they scoff at the idea of giving uh, FFPs to somebody who's clearly coagulopathic with two liters coming out of their chest tube that's actively getting more and more pink and almost a rosé color. And they're scoffing at the idea of giving... Uh, FFPs because the INR is 1.5. The fact of the matter is you have to replace it because your body's using them up. It's, it's actively using up that protein. And um, I guess that's, that's the best argument that I can make for it. So uh, you can give FFPs liberally in cases of hemorrhagic shock. Don't be afraid of doing it. And if somebody gives you hell, just give them the excuses that I've just given you. Or the reasons, more aptly, the reasons that I've just given you. Uh, platelets go about 40 to 60 cc's a unit. Uh, you can't get them per unit in reality unless you work in a pediatric center, which uh, I don't. I mean, kids scare me for multiple reasons. Uh, but particularly uh, pediatric traumas is sort of, uh, it's one of my weaker points. It's kind of my Achilles heel. You'll usually get them either triple donored from three different donors grouped into uh, units of five to six or from a single aphorese donor. Uh, expect very modest increases in the number. Uh, the fact of the matter is platelets above 75 uh, for semi-elective or elective surgeries are usually okay, especially if they're minor surgeries, apart from surgeries in the eye, uh, possibly the brain and uh, closed vaults such as the face and the eye. I think that those are the only ones that I can remember right off the bat. Um, certainly I've put in uh, central lines and done things like that with platelets uh, around about the 25 to 50 mark uh, with no problems whatsoever. Uh, you just have to apply pressure for a little bit longer to abate the bleeding. Maybe take a stitch if you have to. Um, each unit of platelets that you give tends to increase them by about 100. The reason why I say tends to increase them is that it's very hard to predict. Because as I would mentioned prior, platelets are extremely finicky. Uh, they're very fragile. And they require a lot of maintenance. You have to keep them agitated in a water bath. It's kind of like 
they're just very fragile. They're, they're, they're very, very finicky. They have to be fed all the time. You have to keep them watered. You have to keep them moving around and shaking around all the time. And they only tend to fight, last for about five days unless they're specially treated with something like glycerol or something like that, which I think nobody does anymore, but I may be wrong. If I'm wrong, I'd like to hear about it, and hopefully I'll get more education than I have right now. Be cognizant of the fact that the minute you're giving unit number of 10 of packed RBCs, for example, if you have a patient with severe bleeding from the operating room, an upper GI bleed, whatever it is, your platelet count will start to drop below 50 if you haven't replaced it. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if it's because you're quote-unquote diluting down the platelets or it's because of the fact that um, patients tend to uh, use up their platelets and, uh, and sequester them, but... but you would be prudent to begin your platelet transfusions at that point. Again, my personal practice is a massive transfusion protocol, um, and we'll talk about that at a later date. But if you don't have one, and if you feel strongly about giving pure blood for a long period of time, you might want to change that practice to improve your outcomes. Uh, lastly, or at least last of the ones that I'll talk about today, uh, I'll be talking about cryo. Cryo is about 30 to 60 cc's per unit. It's basically pure fibrinogen, and it's given for cases of disseminated intravascular coagulation with uh, fibrinogen levels that are depleted, and clearly depleted below 0.25. Uh, expect to rise about 10 milligrams per deciliter for every bag that you give. Every bag has about 5 to 10 units in it. I've never given more than a bag at a time for somebody with acute severe bleeding because FFPs tend to compensate and help out as well. Uh, please keep an eye out for adjuncts to this and um, please avoid the following. A, hypothermia from giving the actual units. Remember, first picture that I showed you, every unit is stored at about minus 5 degrees, at least, if not minus 20 degrees. That will make your patient cold. Make sure that you use a warmer and a runner. B, avoid giving crystalloid as something of a strategy. You're not doing anything with that. Uh, as I showed prior, you're uh, reducing blood viscosity, you're augmenting cardiac output in ways that may not be great, particularly in somebody who's uh, fairly young, uh, fairly old. Uh, in fact, there was a very good study that showed that uh, hemodilution will make you a little bit crazy, uh, and I'll reference it a little bit later on in the podcast and the written aspect of it. And um, avoid hyperkalemia from uh, potassium leak from older blood. Again, I refer to this as old blood syndrome, and, and hopefully I'll be giving an episode on that. And be cognizant of the citrate effect. Replace your calcium as the more citrate that you give, the more calcium citrate is formed, the less functional calcium you'll have in circulation. I usually give it as part of my transfusion strategy. And remember all of your adjuncts, such as transexemic acid, the use of a warmer, as mentioned prior, and other uh, cofactors that may come into play. Um, other cool shit to talk about in uh, future episodes will be things like um, artificial hemoglobin in HBox, uh, freeze-dried plasma and powdered plasma-based products in resuscitation, particularly in places and austere circumstances where uh, the use of quote-unquote fresh or processed live human blood products might be an issue, and uh, other adjuncts, as well as uh, transfusion strategies, and what to do if you don't have them in your hospital. Uh, that'll be something else that I'll talk about because uh, I seem to be suffering from that at the moment myself, to put it mildly. Uh, thank you all for listening. I'm sorry if I spoke a little bit too quickly. And uh, let me know if your suggestions. I'll be more than happy uh, to have open discussions about this as I have more and more vo- populars and I start making more and more clinical podcasts. And let me know about your suggestions again. Uh, Do you feel that I should be talking more about surgical stuff, more about procedural stuff, more general surgery, more active resuscitation stuff? You guys let me know. And uh, thank you for listening. Saud Al-Zaid signing off.